All right, our last two uh, sections of the notes, you know, dealing with Genesis before we move on uh, next time to, uh, to Exodus. Just as I did for the Torah as a whole, and particularly now as we get to the individual books as they've been classified in, uh, in our church tradition, and uh, particularly when we think in terms of exposition, expository preaching, that uh, the, the major units that are exposited by preachers are the books of the Bible. And uh, so, you know, once within the tradition, like Genesis is looked at as a book, uh, you have... Uh, you have different kinds of resources. Now, gentlemen, I want you to be Bible readers, not commentary readers. Commentaries are there to help you understand what you're reading in the biblical text. Uh, they are to be tools and not crutches. By the way, that goes even when we get to New Testament to the expositions by our own presidents. Our tools, not crutches. You don't get a MacArthur commentary and then preach word for word what Dr. MacArthur has in his commentary. It's a tool to help you understand the text and understand how to uh, exposit, how to explain that, uh, that text to the audience, to the congregation that God gives to you. And so I give you tools, not to be abused, but to be used. And uh, and I have divided them into three separate categories because you are going to be ultimately preachers, expositors, expounders of the biblical text. And you're going to go, as I said, usually through the biblical text in a book-by-book -book fashion. So there are exegetical commentaries. Now, this is why you're at TMS, to learn Hebrew and Greek. And right now, Hebrew is taking some of you. Some of you are taking Hebrew. Some of you are being taken by Hebrew, even as we speak, or Greek. But, uh, but you are here to learn, to learn to read the text in the original language. And exegetical commentaries assume a working, reading knowledge of the Hebrew. And uh, if you take a look at Gordon Wenham's work in the Word Biblical Commentary series, you'll, you'll recognize that, uh, uh, like most commentaries, they will they give the Hebrew, and then they'll give the English translation, either the version they're using or the, or the commentator's own translation. Hamilton will basically put uh, notes by transliteration in, uh, in his footnotes. But uh, to make sense of those footnotes, many times you need to know, well, what Hebrew term, or what Hebrew phrase is he referring to by that, uh, by that transliteration. So these are text uh, commentaries that in some way assume a working knowledge in the, uh, the biblical languages. And that's what you're here studying to receive. And, um, and so the two great evangelical works on the book today are by Gordon Wenham and Victor Hamilton. And um, I lean towards seeing, if I had to choose between one or the other, uh, telling you to get uh, Wenham, but uh, there, there's enough uh, that is valuable in both that I haven't, uh, I haven't taken to star and say, of, of what I've recommended, this is the one to get. And in an English interpretation, these are interpretive volumes. They're seeking to help the English readers make sense, interpret the biblical text. The commentator knows the languages, but he does not assume any kind of language knowledge, Hebrew knowledge for the Old Testament, Greek knowledge for the New Testament, on the part of the reader. What makes English interpretation commentaries valuable for you is they are seeking to give their interpretation in a way that is understandable for an English-speaking audience. All right, now most of you are going to be speaking to English speakers. 
If not, you'll have to translate this and use this in the language that you're going to preach in. But it's good to see, well, how does somebody else who interprets the text, how do they explain it, you know, in, in a way that uh, uh, they have sought to make that accessible to someone who does not know the original languages, exactly what you're doing in the pulpit. So I find the English interpretation commentaries one or two valuable to have as well. Once I've wrestled with the text, what I think, you know, that it means exegetically, well, how can I explain that in a way that's going to be understandable to an audience that does not know the original languages? Well, you've got some tools that already seek to do that. And then you have what we know as expositional, which in one way or another are either, with Ken Hughes's volume, his actual sermons that he gave on Genesis reproduced word for word in his preaching the word volume. That's also what you have with Dr. MacArthur's commentaries on the New Testament. They are expositional. They're literally what he preached. And uh, usually what, uh, what is added to expositional commentaries are two things, illustrative material and application. Not just, this is what the text meant, but this is its implications, its applications for those of us as believers in Jesus Christ, for those of you who don't know Christ you know, evangelistically. And uh, so you will have that element in, uh, in these expositional commentaries. Or in Ross and Walton, you have commentaries that that yes, give what they believe is the interpretation of the passage, but then they will, either at the principal level in Walton, or actually with expositional outline and content in Ross, will say, and now from that exegetical, interpretive understanding, this is the way I would preach it. Now, whether Ross ever preached you know, I do not know, but he moves from exegetical outline, exegetical um, uh, English interpretive statements to, and here's how there is an expositional outline and, ex and an expositional explanation to help people to not only understand but apply the text. The NIVACs um, go from original meaning to bridging the context to contemporary significance. And so they don't preach it for you, but they have you think through the process of going through your exegetical uh, conclusions to now, all right, what's the implications as far as a contemporary audience is concerned? And by their bridging the context, they kind of help you to think in terms of how do you go from then to now? How do you bridge, you know, the, uh, the context between the, uh, the world of the Bible and the world to which you preach? And uh, many times we'll get into some of the issues we will, you know, uh, deal with on a, well, so what? So if that's what it meant to them, uh, all right, in, in, in what way are we like, you know, Israel on the plains of Moab, and how are we, are we dissimilar? What, uh, you know, what are we to take, you know, and say this directly applies to us and, you know, where do we say, okay, this is how that applied to them, and we can see a basic principle that, you know, on the basis of the New Testament can apply to us, you know, today. So, the, these are all beneficial when it comes to what God has called you to do, which is ultimately preach the text. And, gentlemen, I say this as a seminary professor, that my greatest goal, you know, as a servant of Jesus Christ, is not just to be in the seminary classroom teaching the Bible, but is ultimately to be taking this Bible and proclaiming it to God's people. And uh, God, many Sundays, has me, just like he will you now in seminary and all of you in the future, you will be called to preach. And, uh, and uh, if 
if you're not preaching, if you're not, if you're not communicating God's word, then, th then you're just learning for learning's sake. And, um, and ultimately, as we talked about you know, two weeks ago, we're not learning for learning's sake. We're learning that God's word would transform us. And then as we share that word, as we proclaim that word, as we explain that word, as we teach that word, exposit that word, God is going to use by means of His Holy Spirit, the Word to transform the people to whom we are speaking as well. It's, it's the, greatest, uh, uh, the greatest ministry that, uh, that God can give to any human being is, 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 is the ministry of being a steward to proclaim and declare the truth of God's Word. And uh, and, and so you need to obviously use all the, the tools that God has given uh, to be able to be most effective uh, in that. Now, you can add to this, uh, certainly when we get the expositional uh, uh, areas, there are many preachers over you know, the last uh, 1900 years of church history that have had their expositions you know, put down into print so you can read what they preached and, um, and look at them. Um, I have to admit, I, I came out of seminary, and my, my library was top-heavy with exegetical commentaries. I, there's something about seminary students, ah, you learn the languages, you, you, you just want to know those languages and use those languages. And uh, now, you know, 40 years into my ministry, what is goal to me is not had just help me understand what the passage meant, but how can I communicate that to God's people? And so I, I invest my time now much, much more than I did at the beginning of my ministry at uh, this level than just this level. You probably heard, as a preacher, don't just give an exegetical dump. You might have heard that from some guy named Steve Lawson uh, a few weeks ago. You know, a, a sermon is not an exegetical dump. It is you taking your exegesis and making it understandable and applicable to the people to whom God has called you to communicate. So that's the great challenge. That's why you're here, gentlemen. You're here to go through this process and gain the ability to use these tools, you know, to, to be able to take God's Word and uh, make it understandable and applicable to the audiences. Well, first of all, understandable and applicable to you and then to the audiences to whom God is going to send you. Now, depending upon time, uh, as, as you uh, think through these different portions of the Word, and we talked about it last week, we are not the first ones to come to these biblical texts. Uh, we have a whole heritage. And, uh, and in our forefathers, they have read through these books, and they have noticed certain interpretive problems, certain interpretive issues that, uh, that need to be resolved. In fact, now they notice them, but at times, these have become very um, even divisive you know, among believers. And we've already talked about our first major interpretive issue of Genesis. And that is, what is its structure? What's its literary structure? And we talked about that, but uh, we can go through some other interpretive issues, and book by book we will, uh, uh, we will do so on, uh, on what I, in my reading, and my preaching and interaction, you know, with people who've heard my preaching, these are the questions they want answered. So what are the questions history says you got to answer? What are the questions for your own personal study you think have to be answered? And you might not think that it's an issue, but if it's an issue to people you're preaching, then that's an interpretive issue you need to wrestle with. All right, what are some of those interpretive problems, some of those interpretive issues. And as I said, we'll take as many as we have time for, and what is very, very valuable is that to the pages I've given to you now, I know this is the old New American Standard, not the 
ESVs you gave, you had uh, given to you, so you'll have to find the passage. But, uh, but many times what we will say in class is also given succinctly in a sentence or two by Dr. MacArthur in the study notes. And, uh, and sometimes um, I sense all I'm doing by going over some of these issues is saying, why is this note in the MacArthur Study Bible? Uh, that's all you're learning. I'm not going to tell you anything that isn't in the study Bible, but other than why is it there? Why did Dr. MacArthur have to speak to that issue? Well, just because that is an issue. All right, so what are some of the major interpretive issues when it comes to Genesis? The first issue within the book itself, as you begin reading, is how do you understand Genesis 1 to 11? What is its literary nature? In fact, this is also uh, dealt with in the, uh, the Word and uh, the, the World and the Word. Uh, Dr. Grassani asked the question, is Genesis 1 to 11 myth, fiction, or history? He read my notes. <laughs> That's because we've all looked at the same works on Genesis 1 to 11. Now, fiction is the fact that uh, it's unhistorical. It never happened. It's, it is so unhistorical, it is of no value whatsoever. Now, obviously, anybody who writes a commentator, a commentary thinks that it has some value, even if it's not history. And that's A and B. Not that it's fiction. The only people who call it fiction teach in universities. If, if, if it's fiction, you're never going to preach. <clears throat> so those who preach, is it myth? That is, these are mythological stories. They're, they're, they're like the ancient myths that are trying to communicate some basic truths about life, uh, but they do it in a mythological, in somewhat of a fictional way. So the truth is, uh, you know, whether Adam lived or not is ultimately immaterial. It's what do we learn from the story of Adam that helps us to live better as men. Um, that we need to realize that we need to overcome temptation, rather be tempted and succumb. I mean, there's, it doesn't make any difference whether it was a Garden of Eden and what supposedly took place in the Garden happened. It, it's it's a, just a good story saying this is the story of every man. You got, you, you're going to have to learn on how to overcome temptation. That's why it's there. So it's, it's myth. Or, one of them in Kidner, is symbolic theology. Uh, they, they read the ancient myths and said, you know what, there, there's, more, there's more of an historical... Uh, content, more, more historical facts. We can't validate every last thing that is in Genesis 1 to 11. But it is, it is an account based upon history. But this account based upon history is not a history lesson, but it is to teach theology. It is symbolic theology. Now, I've never figured out the difference between A and B. I mean, my crass way of discernment is it's how evangelicals can say there's something historical about the text, but still say it's not historical. It's symbolic theology. And of course, since we are all committed to evangelical theology, it kind of saves our conscience to say, well, this is symbolic theology and not myth. Myth is a term used by those liberals. Um, but I know at the end of the day, what you know, there's a whole lot of difference between the two. 
Now, I would say this, that yes, Genesis is teaching theology. Genesis 1 to 11 is very, very theological. It's telling us something about God and, and man's relationship to God. It is theological. But it is still also historical. These things really happened the way the Bible describes it. Uh, number one, there is no literary distinction between the first 11 chapters and the last 39 chapters of Genesis. No discernible literary distinction, the same literary style. And uh, this has been worked out by Hebrew grammarians. And, uh, and certainly there is a narrative style. It's not poetic, it's narrative. Uh, that is in Genesis 1 to 11. When Israel is hearing this on the plains of Moab, and you said afterwards, do you think that uh, Adam and Noah are, are symbolic individuals? They would say what? No. The six days of creation is what? Well, particularly when you've been keeping the Sabbath, as we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Obviously, the six days equals six days. I, I know what six days is because, you know, the, the commandment tells me six days you are to labor and the seventh day you are to rest because in six days God created the heavens and the earth, made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested. So every six days you work and every seven days you rest because that's the way God did it. So don't get into me on all the ways Yom can be taken within the, the, the Torah. I mean, that's just the way it is. So it, they would see it as a historical narrative. There are many discernible, as you can see, historical features. 64 geographical terms. <laughs> you know, beginning in, you know, chapter 2, you know, verse 14. The name of the third river is the Tigris, and the fourth river is Euphrates. Well, you're going to go through the rest of Scripture and see the Tigris and Euphrates be mentioned. All the way to, you know, Revelation 16, when the Euphrates is dried up so the kings of the east, you know, can come and invade the, uh, the promised land. So you got, you got geographical terms. You got 88 personal names. You got 48 generic names. You know, different kinds of metals. And it's not just metals, but it, uh, you know, literally, you know, says, um, uh, you know, what, uh, what these, uh, uh, what these uh, metals uh, were that were found, you know, in, in uh, the garden. There, there's gold, there's bedulum, there's onyx stone. I mean, these, these are real things. There are 21 cultural items. You know, wood, metals more broadly, buildings, musical instruments. Um, it, you're, you're, you're listening to this on the plains of Moab, and as Israelites, you're saying, these are, these are individuals, and these are things, and these are places that we are aware of. What do you mean, symbolism? And then for those of us who are new... Testament believers. The New Testament mentions Adam and it mentions Noah. It mentions creation, it mentions the flood. Can I put it this way? Jesus didn't hesitate, you know, speaking about Adam and speaking about Noah. Now, the liberals say, well, it's just accommodating to the to the to the audience because they believed it. And uh, my answer is, Jesus Christ spoke truth. And if he, if he said a certain event happened, a certain individual lived, they did. He spoke truth. And uh, so New Testament confirmation for those of us who are believers. So we, we enter into our reading of all of Genesis saying God is recounting through Moses what happened in history. 
So first on the plains of Moab, Israel might learn, and now as written scripture, that we might learn who God is, what God did, and why. And what is the significance? What was its significance to Israel? And with understanding the significance to Israel, what is its significance for us? So gentlemen, you don't read through saying, did this person exist? Did this really happen? It did. And, uh, and God's Holy Spirit has given this text to us. And, and an accurate in, in translation means that this is exactly what God said in the original, and that's how we are to understand it. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some things very difficult to understand. And it's amazing that uh, many interpreters never get out of Genesis chapter 1. <laughs> I, I have literally read commentaries where a third of the commentary is devoted to Genesis 1 and 2. Well, why? Because this is why pe where people read and have all kinds of questions. All right, well, what are some of those questions? Well, how do we grammatically understand the first five verses of Genesis? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, there was morning, one day. Right? Is that a literary unit? Or does verse 1 stand by itself, followed by verses 2 through 5? That's what... Uh, the, uh, the gap theory, which is very unlikely with Hebrew grammar. In the beginning, God created, and the earth became formless and void, and God said, let there be light. That There's three distinct uh, statements that are made there. Verse 2 certainly seems like what is known as a circumstantial clause. It gives the circumstances underlying the events that uh, are then recorded in verses 3 to 5. Is this talking about God's original creation or a recreation? Is in the beginning God created, is it really not the beginning and did this not really begin God's creation of the universe? And my answer would be it's not a recreation, this is the creation of the universe. In the beginning, it's very interesting that is echo when you get the New Testament in John 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him. All right, so in the beginning, in the beginning was God. And in the beginning, the Word created. So... Uh, the best way is to see that this is the original creation of the heavens and the earth. So where does day one begin? Does it begin in verse one, or does it begin in verse two, or does it begin in verse three? And by the way, you will notice that the commentaries I've recommended to you, and the more general one volumes that uh, I spoke about last week, different decisions are given. It would seem as though all five verses are best taken to speak of the first day. This was the beginning. And in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and he brought forth the earth in this way, verse 2, for whatever purpose, the earth is formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. The Spirit was moving over the surface of the waters. And then beginning with the rest of day one through day six, and uh, we'll talk about this uh, down in the chart that uh, you can download, and that is that uh, that which is uh, 
Uh, that which was formless is given form, and that which was empty or void was filled. With a correlation between what happens on day one to three, as far as the forming and the filling that took place on days four through six. But all of, uh, of uh, verses one through five are day one. I will say just a quick word about the, uh, the Spirit of God, which the New American Standard properly translates. It's, it's interesting because in the account, remember I said there's a lot of echoes of uh, Genesis 1 in the flood account, and one of those is 8-1. Uh, God remembered Noah and all the beasts and all the cattle that were with him, and God caused a wind to pass over the earth, and the water subsided. God caused a ruach. Now, it doesn't say the ruach of God. It just God brought a ruach. And I think it best understood this point as wind. Remember, ruach can mean basic up on context, spirit, wind, or breath. And the context 8.1 certainly seems to say wind. Well, on that basis, because God used a wind in chapter 8, well, does that assume, therefore, he also used a wind, and the wind was, uh, was on the face of uh, uh, hovering over the surface of the waters. The Spirit of God was moving or literally hovering over the face of the waters. Well, why do we say spirit in chapter 1 and wind in chapter 8? Because of the verbs. Wind doesn't hover, brood over something. <laughs> wind moves. Spirit and was moving as again, probably not the best thing. It was hovering. It was it was it was brooding over. It's like it's like a bird that sits upon its nest. Uh, the spirit was hovering over, brooding over the surface, the face of the waters. And uh, so it's it's not it's not a wind of God, the breath of God, a mighty wind. It is best seen as the spirit of God. And, uh, and I, I give you most of the commentaries except that. Now, uh, some of the new evangelical commentaries are moving toward the, uh, the wind from God or the mighty wind. Um, I have to bring that up. Why is that important? In the beginning, God created. The Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said. And so we have God, we have Spirit, and we have the Word of God in three verses. Now, gentlemen, I don't, I don't think at this point this was to say, hey, mark this down. This is the first revelation of the triunity of God in the Bible. Because I don't think Israel and the plains of Moab would have heard that. They would have heard God, their God, Yahweh, created. With his spirit hovering over the waters until such time as he started to speak. But as you come to the New Testament where, and God was a triunity in Genesis chapter 1, that, um, that we understand it was the triune God that was creating. That there is an aspect in which each member of that triunity was involved in the creation process. Now, from the New Testament, you got to be careful because in the beginning, Elohim, God, created the heavens and the earth. As you get to the New Testament, who is the one who created the heavens and the earth? Jesus Christ, not God the Father. And the means of God creating was His Word. 
the Word of God. All things came into being through the Word. And so it is Jesus Christ, using His basic attribute of Word. Um, so, uh, so really, in what sense is, is God the Father, based upon the New Testament, involved in creation? Well, He is the, he is the planner, the determiner, but the medium through which He creates is uh, the Word. The Creator itself is, uh, is the second person. So because of that, don't, uh, don't go out and preach the triunities in the first three verses of Genesis. Uh, he, he is, you know, because uh, once you see God, Yahweh, I mean, He's a triune being. But on every given past the Old Testament, on the basis of the New Testament, I mean, He was being emphasized. Israel would not know. They, they, they don't have enough revelation to be able to make that assumption. Uh, you can uh, you can hear Dr. Murphy's uh, message on the triunity in the in creation in Genesis chapter one. Uh, the faculty lecture, and you'll get that. So once you get these notes, uh, I'll I'll uh, relay uh, uh, that article, you know, for you to look at uh, when you think in terms of the meaning of ruach of of uh, Elohim, the spirit of God in uh, in one two. A lot of ink been spilled on how do we understand day, yom. And uh, I'll just uh, go right down to uh, the, uh, the major viewpoints uh, today because um, really in our circles, and I'll, I'll leave that there, see if we can just get that. No, yeah, it's going to show. There we go. All right. Um, because really in our day, the discussion comes down in our circles to what I have listed as A and E. All right, so let me put that up there. There you go. The 24-hour day, and I know theory because all do not hold it, and the literary framework, theory, or you can put interpretation. Now, both of these positions hold that Yom, understood in Genesis 1, refers to a 24-hour day. You say, then, what is the difference? Well, the difference is, coming back to our symbolic theology, that as I've given the chart for you, there's a very definite structure, literary structure, to Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. And I, I've given you a chart out there for you. As I said, as God brings forth creation on, uh, on day one, He brings it in a certain way. So that then through the rest of day one through day six, He can fashion it and fill it. And on the seventh day, rest from His creation work. And Yom, and it's interesting that the one who holds symbolic theology takes the fact that this has been held as a 24-hour day by a majority of commentary, the commentators, both Jewish and Christian, for a very simple reason. Every day ends with evening and morning. One day, second day, third day, etc. All right? Every 24-hour period has one evening, one morning. The numerical adjective, when used with Yom throughout the Torah, always refers to a singular day, a 24-hour period. We've already talked about Exodus 20.11. Israel had six days of work and a seventh day of rest based upon God's work in making the, uh, the heavens and the earth. So trying to change the meaning of uh, Yom, day, within Genesis 1 has been tried over the years. That the days equal a long period of time, or there is a long period of time between the days, or these days are Moses receiving the revelation which of course meant that 
to the end of every day. As they come back tomorrow, I have, God hasn't told me what the next, next thing is. So day one, day two was the days God gave the revelation to Moses. Uh, no, it's all part of a unified narrative. So they, they don't work. So those who would uh, say that we are to understand uh, this because of its literary structure saying, well, that's what it is. It's, it's the fact that in the ancient world they saw supernatural, spectacular events taking place in a day. And so obviously something as great as creation, this stupendous work was, was days. And these, these are not actual literal days. They are the literary framework that is being used by Moses and the Spirit of God to communicate it to his audience on the plains of Moab. Again, my basic problem with that is Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. Did the Israelite on the plains most say, oh, this is, just, this is just literarily put out this way. This is not the way it really happened. This is not history. It is just a, a literary way of communicating what happened in history. See how this gets very, very close to symbolic theology. And, uh, and this is uh, growing in acceptance among many evangelicals today. It reflects history, but it's not history. Now, I agree that there is a very definite literary pattern, and you know why? Because under the Spirit of God, Moses has selected certain things that happen on the sixth day of Christ, in fact, the seventh day of rest, and put them into a literary framework to make them easily understandable, but in that, he has put in a way that is literary, but that literary framework reflects actual historical occurrence. We're going to see this again next week. The plagues of, of Egypt, as they are narrated, have a very definite literary pattern to them. And why could Moses develop that literary pattern? Because he had actual events that he could record that followed that pattern. And at times he emphasizes, you know, a certain, uh, certain aspects uh, to communicate that pattern. But it's not ahistorical. To say that it's literary, and that means it's ahistorical, is to say the whole Bible is literary, therefore what? Ahistorical. So, um, um, so my viewpoint would be that uh, they are real 24-hour days that uh, God created, as stated in Genesis 1. At the uh, very end of chapter 1, man is made in God's image according to his likeness. And uh, the question that comes is the image of God, because in the image of God he is to then subdue and rule over the earth. Is the, uh, is the image of God the fact that man in some way reflects God? When, when the created animals see man, they see a reflection of God, or is he a representative? of God? And my answer is yes. The image of God is the fact that man reflects God. Well, how does he reflect God? Well, God endows him with functions in his body that allow him to interact with the world, the earth, in the same way that God is able to interact with all of creation. As you go through the Bible, not that God has a body, but God, God is able to hear, God is able to see. And so he gives to man what? Through his ears, through his eyes, the ability to hear, the ability to see. 
he also gives him, just because God has volition and God has emotion, um, God has the capacity to think, therefore man has the capacity to think, to, rash, to reason. He has reason, he has mind, he has will because God has will, he has emotion because God has emotion. So, um, so I believe this is, this is looking at the totality of man being a reflection of God so that man might fulfill the purpose for which he has been made of representing God ruling over the earth in God's stead. So it's a combination of A and C, uh, though certainly um, I think it goes back to the ancient Near East where when someone would conquer, he would establish an image of himself, uh, a statue to remind, even though he wasn't physically present, that he was still he was still the ruler. He was still in control. And by the way, they would be called images and likenesses of the ruler. So man is not is not a statue. He is a you know an image that uh, represents God. Just as just as those images that uh, uh, in some way were reflected when they saw the images, they saw something of that individual. But what they were reminded of is that individual rules over us. And so it is both A and C. Chapter 3, verse 15, after, after the disobedience of the man and the woman, God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now remember we talked about the fact that C is a singular term that can have a corporate meaning. Yet the terminology picked up in the latter part of the verse is that it is a singular seed, he who shall bruise you a singular seed on the the head and you singular shall bruise him on the heel. Well, some say uh, the singular is just going on the fact that the term itself is singular, but the concept is plural. So a corporate understanding, i.e., that all this is saying is there's going to be continued enmity between the wicked and the righteous, or a continuing enmity that ultimately culminates in an individual victor. But the most classical way, traditional way, and I think best way to understand it is the seed here is, is by, on the basis of he shall bruise you and you shall bruise him as singulars that is looking to ultimately a, a confrontation between the singular seed of the serpent and the singular seed of the woman. And the serpent being used by Satan that is looking ultimately at Satan or even Satan's representative and the Messiah. Now whether that is to be interpreted at what happened at the cross or what will happen at the second coming of Jesus Christ, What is, the, what is the ultimate uh, referent of that uh, singular understanding? And I don't know. Uh, certainly the classic Christian understanding is, is at the cross, Satan inflicted a bruise on Messiah's heel i.e., what is ultimately a non, a, a non mortal wound, and uh, he shall bruise you on the head. He shall crush your head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Crushing of the head is a, is a lethal 
resulting in death. And so it's usually thought in terms of uh, this is the place where yeah, Christ was wounded, but in that wound, he won the ultimate victory over Satan. I say that because crushing of the head is tied in uh, later in the Torah in Numbers 24 to what Jesus Christ is going to do to his enemies at the second coming, at the end of the days. This is the, you know, the, the one, the uh, star is going to come out of Jacob, is going to crush the head of his opponents. So that thing you understand, it could be looking, you know, to, to ultimately, singularly, the Messiah and uh, the, uh, the defeat of Satan's uh, tool, just as his serpent was the tool here, his tool which would be the Antichrist in the future. Not the traditional, but I'm not sure that that not, might not be the way to understand it here. The enmity between you and the woman, and, um, and that enmity is, yes, something that begins, but really what it focuses upon is ultimately this enmity, this attack that is going to culminate um, in the victory of the woman's singular seed over the singular seed of the, uh, the serpent. What is the identity of the sons of God in chapter 6, verses 2 to 4? With Dr. MacArthur, I believe that they are angelic beings. I think that's clear from the way it's picked up in the New Testament. Is that clear in Genesis 6? And my answer would be no. By the way, it's very, very interesting that as you go through the first 11 chapters of Genesis, do you realize that there is nothing explicit about the angelic realm? Even Genesis chapter 3, the serpent is the serpent. It's an animal that God created. Now, did the serpent speak as the serpent? And my answer is, I don't know. I don't think so. Because it seems as though speech goes back to the image of God. God speaks, therefore man speaks. Now, I know we have all kinds of people who think they can talk to the animals, the animals can talk to them. But um, it is certainly not with human speech. Uh, you, don't, you don't go home this afternoon and carry on a conversation with your dog. I mean, if the serpent shows up in, in the garden to Eve and started speaking, wouldn't you think the first thing she should say is, what are you talking about? Why are you talking? <laughs> and by the way, she should have also said, because he's the, he's the a serpent who was a, a beast of the field, she should have said, you know, back in Genesis 1, of course she couldn't say that because she didn't know about Genesis 1. She says, back in, in creation, God gave us dominion over you. Shut up. She didn't, and therefore she got herself into trouble. But, uh, um, but are these angels? Well, I wouldn't expect anything explicit. But, um, but who are the sons of God who saw the daughters of men? And, um, and, and in some way, this um, brings about God's judgment, man is flesh, his days will be 120 years till the flood is brought, and, uh, and certainly sons of God can refer in other passages, even in the Torah, to angelic beings. It, it's, it's, it's possible, it's again like triunity. Uh, Moses has not clearly re revealed anything about the angelic realm at this point, so how can he speak about um, about angels when there's nothing angelic so far. In fact, the first time we really see anything about the angelic realm is when the angel of the Lord comes, and the angel of the Lord speaks for Yahweh himself, and even claims to be Yahweh. 
But the angel of the Lord is accompanied by two other men. Remember in Genesis chapter 18, and who are those other men? I don't think they're the other two members of the Godhead. So they would be angels. And they're really, that's the, the first time that the veil is pulled back, and obviously as we go through the Bible, more and more will be said of this realm, this personal realm that exists, that is, uh, that is not human, and though interacting with this world is not of this world. It's not of this earth. So God really doesn't tell us in Genesis or anywhere in, in uh, all of the Scripture, you know, when the angels were created. And, um, and uh, yet, obviously, they are involved as ministers of God, even in the Old Testament. So I, I would lean to A uh, as having the stronger position than, uh, than the other viewpoints. What about the extent of Noah's flood? Well, I believe it was worldwide, and I give you the, uh, the reason why. The death of all creatures. It was a local flood, and some say, well, it just says it flooded the earth, which means flooded the land. You know, the land is a restricted uh, area. So why worldwide? Well, it destroyed all creation. Why even build an ark? Just have Noah move. The depth of the water, which was higher than all the mountains of the earth. Now, if you know anything about, you know, water, um, it, uh, it's always going to, you know, if there's a higher place, it's always going to flow what? Down. So if it's above, then it, it, it's, it's got to be, be above the highest point on the earth at that point. And of course, no matter where upon the earth, I mean, if it's not the highest point on the earth, it's going to flow down somewhere. The duration of the flood, 150 days, laid a biblical testimony that it was worldwide. And by the way, it's very, very interesting today that uh, what some 200 and some different cultures have been found, and every one of them has a flood story. I mean, even on the island of uh, the uh, islands in the South Pacific, they have a flood tradition. But somewhere in the past, they, they talk about their lands being flooded. Now, now, there are little islands in the middle of the ocean, and they're talking about there was a time when there was a flood. So how, how did this information get to all the cultures? Well, it could have been a local flood, and then when they were scattered, they took the tradition with them. I understand that, but it's very, very interesting, a worldwide flood, and, and the fact that God judged by, by flood, the gods, whoever they see as the gods, judged by a flood, by a flood of water, is something that has now been found in some over 200 cultures around the world. Very interestingly. That's not biblical, that's just interesting. The first, uh, the first ones were. Why was Cain uncursed when it was Ham's sin that was recounted? So 924, when Noah awoke from his wine, he knew what his youngest son had done to him. So he said. <coughs> Cursed be Canaan. Well, what happened to Ham? And my answer is Noah at this point, on the basis of what had taken place, is given insight by the Spirit of God to speak as a prophet. Cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants he shall be to his brothers. But he also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. Servant. Canaan is to be a servant, he's to come under 
the dominion of Shem. But why Canaan instead of Ham? Because this curse upon Ham, because of what is taking place, is going to be localized by God in one of his descendants, and that is Cain. Not all of his descendants. Remember the Noahic covenant. The Noahic covenant where God has said, I'm not going to bring a total and complete judgment. And there's an echo of this here. And why prophetically Canaan? Um, because Canaan is the people whom God wants Israel to judge and get their land. Chapter 10. Last week. So why the emphasis on Canaan is because this curse prophetically Noah anticipates is going to come about upon Canaan and Canaan alone among all of Ham's progeny. The rest of Ham's progeny are not under this curse. And uh, beyond that, this uh, curse culminated with Israel's conquest of and destruction, which they should have destroyed, but only made servants of the Canaanites historically. And there's no cursed people you know, upon the earth that you can't take a look at the rest of the members of him and say, they're under the curse. They are not. So, uh, so I would, uh, I would uh, see this as uh, Canis descendants cursed the Noah looks as it were as a prophet and sees what God is going to do. 